Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash swirlsuite. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Welcome to Swell Suite, everybody. I guess we can get back to our formal introductions that we used to do. So, hi. In case you don't know me, I am Sarita. You can follow me at Vine Me Up. You can also follow the Swell Suite on all social media. And you can follow our podcast wherever you find your podcast. Tanisha. Now that you mentioned that, um, yeah, I guess it has been a minute since we've yeah. done like the formal. We just yeah. get on and just we start just, talking. Exactly. Like y'all know who it is, you know who we are. <laughs> like it's fine. Uh, but yeah, it makes sense. Um, yeah. I'm Tanisha, girl meets glass. Uh, and yeah, I am a part of this world suite, and I talk about wine and spirits and um, all things generally liquory. So. <laughs> Speaking of spirits. So yesterday I went to the Brown and Balanced event at Jack Rose. Oh, yes. yes. That was so much fun. It was, uh, I don't know, it was so nice because it was black people, good cocktails, and music. Mm-hmm. So, and good food and cookout yeah. food. Yeah. All of those things. Yes. And so this was in celebration. I had never heard of Brown and Balance until you sent me the flyer. So, um, so hey, apparently. Josh, Mr. Mixologist on Twitter, he goes from city to city and has these events to highlight black bartenders and spirits industry. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, in conjunction with the Lush Life Productions is how it started, a company that he works for, and they um, do a lot of education and events for bartenders. Um, they started with uh, Portland Cocktail Week that they used to do, and so now they do Bar Institute and Bar Econo, which is them on the road going from city to city okay. having um, different educational events. And then as a part of that, they do Brown and Balance in order to highlight black bartenders because we are very... Excuse me. They are very. Uh, <laughs> I'm thinking we because I'm. Well, I mean, you don't you don't consider yourself a bartender. No. Okay. Okay. No, not like on their level. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I could make you a classic drink, but if you want me to, like, ooh, give me something <laughs> creative, I'm like, you gonna drink this old fashioned? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was really cool though, and so there were five um, specialty cocktails, and the five, and they were all female. They were all black uh, black women. Yes. So yeah. So all of the bartenders created their own um, their own cocktail, and we got to taste them all, and um, they were fantastic. They were fantastic. Check um, my Insta stories highlights at Vine Me Up. I still have it up there, so I'll keep it there for a while because it was really it was it was iconic. It was great. It yeah, you are. Um, I watched the story and was like, "This is what's up. This yeah. is fun." Yeah. I attended um, a Brown and Balance event. They did mm-hmm. one at Bar Institute New York. So when I was there uh, last year after the Wine Bloggers Conference. So that was my first experience with it. And it was a good one. It was lit because also, I mean, it was a part of the whole um, Bar Institute and it was at night and it was New York. So, sure, yeah, sure. Awesome. Nice. So what did you do this weekend? This weekend, what did I do? I enjoyed the beautiful weather. Yes, the weather over the weekend here. was amazing. Um, just hung out with some friends. I got around the city. Nothing, you know, too much or too big or anything like that. Yeah. It was just, you know, it, it was just that, yeah. Fantastic. Oh, and also, um, on Friday night, I went to the live show for Getting Grown Podcasts. So if you don't know Getting Grown Podcasts, it's Jade and Kia. They are friends with the whole Loudspeakers Network um, podcast family in New York. So if that's, of course, The Read, um, The Friend Zone, and some other podcasts out of New York. But um, yes, of course, um, Crystal and Kid Fury made little cameos and participated in some, um, you know, and some talking or whatever, talking trash and giving advice and that kind of stuff. It was really cool. And it was in Anacostia. So, um, nice at, at the arc. Yeah, it was really okay. nice. Yeah, it was really cool. 
Really cool. And cool that they were like, we're about to go down to Kasi. We're going to have our stuff. I mean, we're not going to have it in exa- Georgetown. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. But it was, yeah, it, it was a busy, it was a busy, but it was a cool weekend. Um, I had a friend in town and I took her to District Winery at the Navy Yard. So okay. That was fun. Um, yeah. So we just walked around. I mean, that was very white, but um, that's fine. You know, so it was a balance. It was a balance. <laughs> right. You was yeah. brown and balanced, uh-huh. and then you was yeah. Yeah. something else. Yes. Yeah. No what <laughs> Um, There was something I had to ask you. What is this time? Really? Ask me. So, yes, I got a comment, and the oh. listeners would like to know what podcasts we listen to. So, do you have any... You have any go to podcasts that you listen to on a daily or like weekly basis? Well, you know, my podcast selection is uh, eclectic, I guess. No, sure. it's all the same. Like, I listen to, you know, things that are all still within the same like range of things. But sure. um, I am really, and it sounds weird to say, I'm really into, but I'm into true crime and always have been. Okay. Um, what a lot of people don't know is my master's degree is in forensics. Mm. Well, one, I have a master's degree and two, it is in forensic sciences. So I am like into all things, true crime, okay. crime related, that kind of thing. So I listen to true crime podcasts. That's where all this is going. I do okay. have a point. <laughs> so I listen to true crime podcasts. So, uh, one of my go-tos, uh, is, uh, sword and scale. Um, my favorite murder um, I listen to, uh, of course, S Town. I listen to uh, that um, criminal. But then, like fun ones, I listen to. It's this super dope podcast called Swirl Sweet. I have listened to that before. Um, I listen to the Read. Mm-hmm. Um, I listen to Bronzeville when that was on, mm-hmm. and I hear they're coming out with uh, the next season soon. So I'm excited about that. Oh. Uh... Other ones that you have told me to listen to for mm-hmm. various reasons or another. Uh, you just mentioned getting grown pot, so yeah. I'm gonna have to listen to that. Yeah, it's very, um, it's very mature. Oh. It's enlightening. It's yeah. enlightening. And then there are a couple of French ones I listen to for language purposes. Yeah, I was about to ask you, do you listen to French podcasts? I do. It's a yeah. couple of them that I listen to. And that so, are what up. are your French podcasts about? Um, one of them is about uh, food. Mm-hmm. So they talk like with different chefs and different uh, food topics. Oh, wow. And then another one is uh, kind of like current events, but told through uh, the the perspective of actors and things in France. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. Some of it I understand. Some of it I don't. Some of it I was like, ooh, that was too fast. <laughs> so, um, so I listen to podcasts every day. So I have a a handful that I listen to every day. Um, okay. So of course I listen to the read and, um, occasionally I listen to the friend zone. Um, I listen to again, grown every week. Um, I like essence. Yes, girl. Essence, okay. I've listened yeah, to that yeah, before. Essence has a podcast. Yes, girl. Cause they have nothing but black stars on there. So that's yeah. interesting to listen to. To listen to them. Um, there's this other podcast that I really like that actually I have, they're like, my podcast idol because they're so creative and uh, it's called Jade and XD. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, you do like them. Yeah. I do, yeah. I take a lot of ideas and sort of flip it with wine. Um, yeah. So I get a lot of ideas from them. Um, there is this uh, podcast called Cocktails. It's a little racy, but um, I like it because at the beginning of every episode, they give you um, a recipe for a cocktail and then they get into like sex stories and legit like cocktails yeah, yeah 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 legit cocktails but um, yeah yes and that's cock like like a real cock like yeah right cocktails. yeah yeah <laughs> i think i think the people got that <laughs> <laughs> um i listen to our wine sister the color of wine um sukari bowman i like her podcast wine schooled um with keith beavers um i like the nod the nod is kind of his brain is a little brainy but it's um 
it's just a girl and a guy they're super smart and they just give their opinion about stuff but it's very um it's very produced now and so they tell stories and they interview people sometimes off the street but it's very black and brainy and i love it um, you listen to a lot of podcasts do you I, have a long commute um, or do you listen to them during the work day so I do not have a long commute, but instead of listening to the radio music, I listen to a podcast. So anytime I'm in a car going anywhere, um, I just plug my phone up and I'm listening to podcasts. So, okay. Yeah. And then, I mean, when I'm in the house, if I'm like cleaning or washing dishes, it's usually a podcast on. So it just replaces music most of the time. Okay, I want to tell you about two more, and then I'm... Oh, yeah, okay. sorry. Okay. And then I will so, come back to how yeah. you can fit all this in. I have <laughs> so, more questions. Um, Rants and Random is a new podcast by Lavia J. Um, and that's pretty good, because she's funny and smart. Um, let's see. Um, hold on. And the thing is, I have to listen to different podcasts, because not all podcasts is on, are on the same app. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. Um... Hold on, I'm almost done. Uh, You're going through your list like, um, I am, scroll, I am. scroll. Okay. Uh, yes, Small Doses. Small Doses by Amanda. I mean, you listen to Small Doses, Amanda Seal? No? Okay. No. You listen, real okay. talk. Like Amanda everything Seals. else that's not a crime podcast, you okay. put me on to them. Okay. If it's not crime or wine, you put me um onto it. Okay. Um so yeah. even things like Side Hustle Pro and oh, the yes. Oprah Pro Show, yeah. like yes. you put me on. Yes. Yeah. Side so, Hustle Pro, that is that's like my oh that's religious. That's that yeah. that's that's literally every week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um there's also a podcast called um Dreams and Drive, that's similar to Side Hustle Pro. They have a lot of the, the a similar style and um, similar guests. Um, but yes, I listen to a shit ton of podcasts. Yeah. Got I want to do better or just figure out how I can incorporate that more into uh, my life and, sure. you know, just listen to it more often. But me, when I commute, I'm on the train or on the bus. Mm-hmm. And I listen to it sometimes if I know I'm going a long distance, but right. if I'm doing short distance or depending on where i'm going i don't like to be as distracted i understand and listening to something like that because it's not like listening to music you can just mindlessly listen to music right on a podcast like i will get caught up in it miss my stop get robbed (laughs) i mean or pickpocketed (laughs) um like anything can happen so i'd like to be more conscious since i'm commuting with you know a group of people you know like in my car okay fine (laughs) And yeah. then when I'm doing work, I mean, I, you know, yeah, I don't know. I feel like with some podcasts, uh, like when I would listen to my leaks or side hustle mm-hmm. pro, sure. I need to listen to it when I can completely focus on it. Cause yeah. like, I need to write, write something down write or like, make a yes. note yeah. or, you know, something like that. Mm-hmm. But some of these other ones. You know, yeah, yeah. I can kind of mindlessly listen to, yeah. or I like it to, I like to be told a story. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm yeah. listening to one now, Empire on Blood, which is a series about this guy who was convicted of a crime. He was a drug dealer back in the day. Convicted of a murder. They actually say he didn't do it, but he's still in jail for it. But he did so much other stuff that, ah, people like, whatever, just leave him in there. Oh, so wow. he's trying to, yeah. So it's like a whole thing. And it's, uh, his guy who used to be like his right hand man, that's the one who snitched on him. Mm hmm. So it's like a whole situation. It's pretty oh good. Goodness. And this, I like it because it, it has a beginning and an end. So it's not one of those podcasts that comes on every week. It's oh, like, all right, okay. this is like a 10-part thing. Okay. It tells a story, and then we're done. Oh, kind of okay. like how S-Town was, you okay. know, or um, Dirty John. Did you listen to Dirty John? I did John? not. It's a, yeah, well, you see how many podcasts I listen to. Those are on my list. Oh, okay. I just haven't gotten around to them yet. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, you definitely have 700 on your list. <laughs> Yeah, so in the description box, I will add some of our favorite podcasts so you can follow them and check them out, guys. So let's take a break. For you, the listeners of Swirl Sweet Podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with the free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. I personally have enjoyed books such as Crush It, Why Now is the Time to Cash In on Your Passion by Gary Vaynerchuk, and Cork Dork by Bianca Bosker. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash swirlsuite. 
Again, that's audibletrial.com slash swirl suite for your free audiobook. Let's get back to the show. Our special guest is Krista Scruggs, Vermont winemaker. So Krista, <laughs> welcome to the swirl suite. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. So we just like to start out with you doing a little introduction of yourself. Um, my name is Krista Scruggs. I am the owner, uh, winemaker and grower for Zaffa Wines. I'm based in uh, Vermont, um, where I, as of this year, um, growing uh, my fruit and forage, my apples, and I ferment in uh, Hill Country, Texas. Uh, I work with a grower there, and I will be planting there um, next year. Um, that's it. <laughs> yeah right no i right. no, i got some questions that's going to get all in your business right, so, and then also it, to say that's it like right. that wasn't a lot like, exactly like exactly. i've named 50 things <laughs> <laughs> that's it everybody <laughs> so how exactly did you get into wine um to not sound contrived i think it just i'm from california originally i moved to vermont two years ago um, so, and I'm from the Central Valley of California, um, and I think for some people, um, being a part of wine culture comes, depending where you're, you know, there's many variables that involve this, but, uh, being California, you're already immersed in wine culture in a way, and, um, my parents, well, particularly my mom and stepdad, I wouldn't say they're bon vivants in any way, but I was... You know, I was learning how to drink certain scotches at a certain age and just drinking responsibly with them. And they're always sharing and sharing what was being poured in the house. And my parents always entertain and so did my grandparent, my grandparents. So to be in a house where food was always cooked, thus there was always wine and alcohol around. Um, my mom and my grandmother, I think, facilitated without them knowing and training my palate and my mom always enjoyed drinking wine with every meal and still does to this day. So that naturally became an immersion for me, I think, from later teenager years and uh, and then continued until my, um, and when I was 25, I'm 30 right now, I was 25, a family member, I was working in San Francisco looking to do something that I felt that was of substance other than just making money per se. And my uncle is a captain, a fire, uh, fire captain in Sacramento. And at that time, I was actually going to transition to becoming a fire, a firefighter. And at that same time, a family friend contacted me and said, I know you're going through a transition, and there's an opportunity for you to work at Constellation Brands, and, uh, which is a big uh, conglomerate, you know, with Bronco and Gallo. And... I took that interview and I was left with, I either become a firefighter or work in wine. Uh, it doesn't sound so altruistic, but I chose the, the wine route and then I went from there. Basically, well, wanted to stay alive. Yeah. Seven years ago and there was, then from there, I, I stopped working there because it didn't really fit with my ethos in regards to, I feel that wine starts with responsible, responsible farming and, uh, minimal hand in the, the winery and although Constitution Brands gave me insight in what I did not want to do, it also pushed me toward what I wanted to be, which is a winemaker. And from there, I just started to apprentice, uh, which I, what I want to do, like just mimic in the old world, I wanted to apprentice other people. So I, started, I learned how to prune in, wa- in the state of Washington for a small girl up, up there. And then from there, I went to Italy. And then from there, I went to France. Then I came back here and really pumped up that I wanted to be a vineyard I wanted to own land and not only, either not only land, have access to land and to grow my own fruit. And so I started seeking people who were doing that here in America. And I was also doing the UC Davis uh, winemaking uh, program. And Deirdre Heakin of Vermont was pouring at a wine fair at Brumaire uh, three years ago. And I introduced myself to her and said, hey, I, this is what I've done this far. I know my shit and I think I should have opportunity to, to work with someone and be a assistant winemaker. That's more or less what I said and we connected and, and then it all <laughs> went from there in a way. Yeah. That's my like summary of the last seven years. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You know, it's been busy. Yeah, definitely. And you know, it's funny. Our last episode was about lowering the drinking age. 
and we had yeah. a lawyer lawyer on and um i think what from what you described from where you started to build your palette at home i'm sure that was before 21. oh absolutely yeah. my grandma's even spiking my eggnog at times like yeah. just so I <laughs> but oh. they know that they were like from eating yeah. like eating home cooked meals and then <laughs> and pairing that with wine and spirits it was trained my pal's been trained since you know my junior yeah. like elementary school on in a way from yeah. food and yeah. introducing alcohol in a responsible way right. which is a it's a, which is an old world way that i think america should be evolving towards in my opinion yeah that i was about to ask you what you thought of that but there it is yeah, yeah. absolutely <laughs> you know when you're by the time i spend in europe it's you're, it, you, you go out to a restaurant, and which will be at 10, 11 o'clock at night, and you know, their kids will be there. And also you're training kids to, to, to act right at a proper setting as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. you know, and also creating their palate and being adults in a way without being adults. You know, I know that's tricky, but yeah. Hmm. So you mentioned how you got to Vermont. We got that. So how did you end up picking Texas as your other farmland location? So when Deirdre and I solidified the plans, I was going to go out there and come out here to work the harvest with her. It was just going to be a harvest. I there I didn't know what was going to come out of it. So harvest in Vermont starts in September, uh, around the, ideally the first second week of September. So I met her in March, and my the class I was taking. Um, was ending in May, June. So I was just chomping at the bits that I need to go back out there and be in a vineyard. So I started looking. At that time, I was, it was, I was becoming very clear that it was going to be pretty unlikely that I was, not, I was going to be able to have access to land, let alone grow land in California. So I started seeking out regions in the United States uh, that land, land is cheap. And I mean, let alone California, Washington, and Oregon, it's, you know, it's being priced out. So I started looking at uh, places outside of California and looking particularly for people who were uh, representing um, my ethos at, the, at, a, at a minimum um, farming. They're farming the land and then if not at that time farming um, organically, at least moving towards that. And so that's how I found Dan. Uh, in Texas. So I just basically put my antennas out there and, and that's, and then, so I did a harvest there, fell in love with the land there and I was offered a job there and he, they knew that they knew I was going to, going to Vermont. And, um, I will never forget. Um, he was like, you're not going to come back here, are you? And he just had this instinct. And so I went to Vermont at the end of that that stage, oh. I got a job offer, and then I was able to keep my relationship. And Dan is a really good friend of mine. And then I was like, "Wow, I could actually treat Texas and Vermont as the southern, northern, southern hemisphere because of the way that harvest starts uh, and ends." And so that's what I did for my first vintage last year. Um, I went to Texas in July, and then was able to process, I was able to pick my own fruit, process, and then get back here still during leaf pulling season and then process here too. And so I'm planning on that's basically going to be a relationship from, with Texas and Vermont from here on out. Uh, wow. <laughs> right. I'm like, uh. <laughs> and I, I, I also, I, I see it as an opportunity because especially someone from being from California, I have so much, you know, if I had it my way, of course I would be making wine and, and growing and in my home state. Uh, but I feel also lucky to be able to tell st a story. People don't realize that as an agricultural crop, wines grow in every state of the union. And to also educate the new role that good wine can be made in anywhere in the United States, anywhere in the world for that matter, with any variety, if you know it's treated responsibly with the right people behind it. So now I've embraced, I, you know, I've, you know, I've been offered opportunities to go back to California uh, in regards to having agency there from friends of mine, and I, I, I have no interest at this point in time or ever now. I mean, I'm literally planted here, um, so. Uh, but I, I feel that this story is more important um, than being in California. Wow! So, yeah. Oh my goodness. So, what kind of wines do you do you make for yourself? Well, this vintage is pretty, was pr this 2017 vintage is pretty interesting. Um, I was hoping to reclaim a vineyard about 
uh, two acres and a village out here called Brandon. Uh, when I went to Texas this year, I came back and that vineyard um, was uh, attacked by Japanese beetles, which eat leaves, and so photosynthesis stopped. So the fruit was unable to ripe. And so I was then like planning to work with these particular varieties and then best laid plans, you know, how it goes. Yeah. And so I, Deirdre um, was able, was kind enough to let me take, I want to say a quarter of a ton. And then I bought some fruit from a grower in upstate Vermont. Um, and so basically I got to a point like, I'm still going to ferment no matter what. Sure. Got in a car accident. Well, Deirdre, Caleb, me and another coworker, we got in a car accident said a car accident led to them meeting their meeting uh, their current lawyer. Current lawyer has 150 acres of pears and apples. So I was at work and Deirdre sends me a text. She's like, you're making cider this year. Basically the, 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 the lower lawyer gave us access, gave me access to all the apples and pears. And so, um, so from there I saved must from harvest and juice and then was able to pick those apples in um, between October and November. And then it just all came, I can't explain how, why, what was going through my head. I really can't. Um, but I decided to do this co-fermentations with the ju uh, grape juice, with apple must and sparkling wines out of that. And um, I did one skin macerated single variety wine from the fruit that Deirdre gave me. And then I did a single variety of fruit from the fruit I brought up state, and then the rest were all the cool ferments. And so this all came out of necessity, and that this I have just like, as long as I have fruit, I could ferment. And I just stayed to what my mission was, was to, to produce for this vintage. And then in Texas, I have a sparkling um, wine made from Ruby Cab, which is a vinifera hybrid um, of carrion and cap soft. And I'm going back to Texas next month to disgorge that and that wine will be ready. I forgot about that wine for a little bit, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I tasted it in December and I was, and um, all this stuff is like, what's been, I've been through a big transition the last two months of now I'm farming 10 acres and uh, for better or for worse, I forgot about that wine because I was actually going to do a champagne method with it. Um, and so I tasted it two weeks ago, and I'm really happy. I think the time that I did not go back, I was supposed to go back to Texas in January, and I think the time that it has been able to send the least did justice to it, and now I, I'm going to like release it as is and not do anything to it. At least that's where I'm at right now. Yeah, so there, that's seven wines. I have seven wines from 2017 vintage. Okay, and I, I have, oh, I have to, one question about what you um, mentioned as far as the um, beetles go um, and how they attacked your vineyard. What what are some things that you can do to prevent that from happening in the future? Because I know that's definitely something that you want to do. And uh, um, how is it that they came to attack you now? Like, is that something that's common in, well, in vineyards and a common problem? In Vermont, that's a common common um, pest in certain regions. And the vineyard I'm managing now, we're not thankfully not gonna deal with that, but we're gonna have our own set of problems, I'm mm -hmm. sure. But in that part of Vermont, that that pest is pretty common and they're just basically traps that you put around the vines. And because uh, we want to work without any chemicals, um, at least I believe in that and then people that I've worked with. So the best thing to do is just, there's these traps that they fly into and they basically drown themselves <laughs> okay <laughs> and, it goes, and that, so this that particular vineyard it was owned it's owned by someone and he lives in florida i believe mm -hmm. and i contacted him um about me taking like reclaiming the vineyard and he was like why would you want that it, everyone in vermont buys their fruit from 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 new york and also it hasn't been sprayed with pesticides and herbicides in a year you're not gonna why would you do that like him not knowing my ethos that i'm anti but as a herbicides, I was like, this is the perfect opportunity. One hasn't been touched, but two, he was interested in getting rid of the vineyard. And he's like, if you want to farm it, good luck to you. And I did. Um, and so I just didn't have time between that, confirming that, and then going to Texas, coming back. It was just too much for me to get a handle on it. 
but I'm not, I'm actually, things worked out the way that it should, it should be. Because I'm not, in hindsight, I'm not mad that I did it. Okay. Now, since you don't use herbicides and pesticides in your vineyard, um, that's something that you're kind of against. Do you make your wines in a natural way also? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I think that word has been, I think there's a lot of confusion on what that word means, mm-hmm. um, where it's a natural wine, and I can speak from my ethos and my mentor's ethos, it means one is starting the farm, um, not using herbicides and pesticides in the farm, and then two in the vineyard, I mean, sorry, two in the winery, um, nothing more um, than sulfur and a reasonable amount of sulfur, ideally no more than 30 ppm of sulfur, um, ideally only at bottling. Um, the wines I made this year are zero, zero, actually zero sulfur. And of course, uh, all the fruit was farm responsibly. So that is my definition of natural wine, okay. um, is, uh, basically zero chemicals in and out the, the vineyard and okay. evolution, um, in both places. Okay. And thank you for explaining that based on how you make your wines, because um, since there aren't really any rules or mm-hmm. regulations to natural, yeah. everybody's natural is something different. Yeah. Um, and it does start in the vineyard, but some people just do it in the vineyard. But then when they actually make their wine, that part is not necessarily done in a completely natural way. There's a lot of, I think we have a lot of big journey and I think, collectively we're going to get there where there's a unified definition of what that looks like because there's also people who yeah who people or people who are farming irresponsibly and just because they're just just because i don't just because they're just only adding sulfur uh and the winery doesn't mean that i would not consider natural wine because you're using herbicides and pesticides in the vineyard and on both sides of it people are trying to get away with um utilizing that word but not actually um taking the risk or I don't want to say risk, but they think it's, a, they think it's a risk to make wine in a way that I define natural wine, but they want to tag on to a word of natural wine, but not actually honoring the ethos. Mm-hmm. Big problems with that. Huh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cause people think they can see an organic label on also organic label on a wine, but in the winery, they could be doing a lot of irresponsible things. And mm-hmm. I don't think people realize that there's a difference between the two. Because right now, you're kind of just believing people when they say this wine is natural. Absolutely. It's not like you can really, unless you're at the winery when they're making it, or you kind of see some behind the scenes <laughs> process, you're taking people's word for it. And I, yeah, and I think the community that I'm so lucky in, in the greater the greater natural wine world, I, it's basically, it is by word of mouth, you know, because one, certification is expensive, and people who are farming in a way that share the ethos I have, they don't have that money to do that either. And so it's been like, for example, real real wine fair, raw, uh, reels in London, raw in New York, and Brumaire, which I just poured, uh, poured at. It is really a community word of mouth and where people are really going to vineyards, to wineries, and you're going to be called out eventually. You can't get away with it. Um, and you will, I mean, Alice Firing just called someone out a couple of days, a couple of weeks, last week about, calling something petit en natural mm-hmm. and it was and so you will be called out and i think it's awesome so people don't have to have these certifications and you're just staying true to your ethos you know mm-hmm. but so i did that right because you could get away with organic certification lets you get away with a lot of stuff too so hmm. yeah. Now, when it comes to the wines that you have, are these, do you create your labels and are these labeled underneath um, you and your partner? I am just me. It's all okay. just me. Uh, and um, in regards to, yeah, all the wines are in Zoffa, owned and only by me. Uh, in regards to the labels, I <laughs> I'm actually just submitted to TTB because before Brumaire, I, I got invited to Port Brumaire, but I didn't have time to uh, submit to TTB. Um, just, and so I'm working on that now because I'm about to be signing on distribution for the next couple of weeks. So, mm. yeah. Can you tell us what Zafa stands for? Zafa stands for Counterspell. Um, it's an ode and a reference to uh, a word used in a book by uh, the author Juno Diaz. Um, the book's called The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde. Um, the word um, is used 
commonly in the Dominican Republic, but um, <clears throat> derives from African lineage. And, um, and so the, the theme in the book is that Fuku means spell and Zafa means counterspell. Um, and it's, it's a bigger reference to colonialism in, in America. Um, and so... You to get deep on that. Yeah, right? <laughs> and so, you know, and there's a, there's a, part, there's a part of the book where uh, the main character uh, is presented with a blank book. And he's based, and he said, writing this book is my own Zafa, meaning my own power spell. And so that connects with me, with me being a woman of color, working in a very, and not very, <laughs> homogenous. <laughs> Uh, industry and world, uh, everything I'm doing is my own counterspell, my own Zafa. So that's what that comes from. Okay, well. (laughs) (laughs) And you have been getting a lot of publicity for this very reason. How are you feeling about all that? Because every time I turn around, there's a new article written about you. Yeah, it's been weird. It's been been weird and exciting. Uh, I've been um, um, humbling in a way, and it's and it also makes me like I think you know this has been a seven year journey um, to get to this point, um, and then most of it, more than anything, it's been cool more than all the press or what the press has done. You know, at least once a week, I'll get a message from uh, a woman of color who's saying like asking me, well, how did you get into wine, and how what what would you suggest that I can do, and just mm-hmm. That is more than anything that means the most to me to have this publicity and to have you know, to be featured in wine enthusiasts for the top 10 women trailblazers in the wine world is really insane. But more than anything, I'm going to get to do what I'm doing. But if I could show other people of color, other marginalized people, like this is how I got my agency in this homogenized world that's not going to get any easier. That to me is what's been the coolest thing about having this press. It's still, it's still, because it's still weird, and I still yeah. get excited about it. But um, I can't, I can't be, I'm not upset about it just because that, that, that right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, what would be your, yeah. what would be your advice just to an aspiring winemaker? Um, it would be, I mean, one to continue to taste and taste and taste and taste and taste if you have access to that. Um, I know that there are a lot of not everyone from every there's class issues that may not make anyone access to be able to taste wine on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have access to a local wine bar and wine shop, all I, what I did was is I announced my intent. I announced my intent universally within my own realm, and I made sure that I made that announcement to people that I came across that this is what I want to be. And then people will listen to you if you really do stick to your intent and purpose. Um, and I would just suggest leading your intent and purpose and making and scream as loud as you can in whatever way that you can. And um, having access to the wine doesn't mean necessarily having money, but it's just that within itself. And I'm sure if you go to wine shops and say, I want to just taste, you could have free tastings and that alone will, and then you just, you, you know, like what I said at Deirdre, like, this is who I am. I want this. And, you know, I was lucky enough to have, I've been lucky enough to have people that I met across the path that have wanted to see me, see my dreams come true in a way. So, and give me agency in a world that doesn't always make it easy for people that look like me have access to that. Wow. (laughs) Awesome answer. (laughs) Um, So uh, how far are you away from like distributing your wine? Um, Are they available now? Can I go to your website and buy a bottle? How's that work? I've been like lagging. It's been like really overwhelming. Um, I have I made my wine my my wine my mind up of who I will be signing with, and this particular distributor will be distributing me within starting up in thirty six states. Um, so uh, that will be announced within the next month. Mm. But I have to get through pruning, and so I mean they're supposed to come out. They're supposed to come out here. Uh, I think. This last week, but didn't work either of our schedules. They're going to come out here in a few weeks, and um, yeah, so that's when that that'll all be done. And then once the TTB label work is all submitted, and then it'll be out. Um, it's not going to be much for the 2017 vintage. I'll be in full production 2018. That I'll be harvesting this year. Um, 
but I'll send you anything that you want. Like you, you guys in particular, I don't care. Oh, girl, you should not have told us that. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was like, well, we about to come up there. And, you know, I should come up here. The site that I'm currently farming is, is gorgeous off the Champlain Islands out here in Vermont. And it's um, about an hour and a half from Canada. Um, the vineyards off the water. You are more than welcome to come out here anytime. Absolutely. My my husband, he spent um, his summers as a kid in Vermont at like camps and stuff. So he loves Vermont. Yeah, it's Ooh. gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <You're wet. laughs> My summer in Vermont as a youth. Him and Fit. Like <laughs> you know how they do with city. You know how you do with city kids. There are different programs that ship them off to different states to give them, you know, exposure. Thing. So that's I don't know about no. that wasn't my inner city. All right, <laughs> I didn't have a Vermont. Okay, not many people have a Vermont. I'm still getting used to a Vermont that I live in. <laughs> I don't have a Vermont. Okay, I do want, I do want to know because um, you did mention in regards to my partner. Uh, I do want to maybe possibly clarify that I am the vineyard that I am managing is owned by a couple. Uh, Robin Kitcher and Napic, and the vineyard is called Ellison Estate Vineyard, and I manage that vineyard. I can I manage all the farming um, there, and I'm growing fruit for myself and other producers and them. Mm. Uh, so, and that's ten acres, and that's a vineyard in Lake Champlain. So, we're different entities in regards to me as Zafa, and then them as their vineyard. But I am working for. I am farming their land. Okay, so it's like I a co-op so. style. No. no. No, they own it and they employ me, and that's it. Okay. And then the people will be buying fruit from us. I'll be, but like that will be fruit that that fruit, which my 2018 vintage, will come strictly from that vineyard uh, that I am managing. And then um, we'll be selling fruit to other Vermont growers uh, because we will be now the only second or third organically farmed vineyard, uh, and that's Deirdre, my previous my mentor and. Who I used to be a system I make it for. She's biodynamic and organically farming. That's another producer who just grows for himself. But we have enough acreage uh, to be able to sell fruit. And it's really important for us to have Vermont wine growers have access to, to, to live fruit and not yeah. conventionally farm fruit. So I'm taking a portion for myself. They're going to, their plan is to eventually make wine, um, the owners of the vineyard, but that's not going to happen in the near future, like in regards to commercial level. And then I personally cannot take on 10 acres of fruit for myself right now. Mm. Uh, and so I'm taking a portion for myself. The remainder will be sold to other grower, uh, other producers out here. Um, and then it's sold directly. It's not, and so we're not necessarily under a co-op like okay. how in France and in Italy. Yeah. Okay. It's, and, and then eventually Ellison Estate Vineyard, and like the owners of Ellison Estate will take a bulk of that fruit for themselves and I'll take a the portion of it and then that'll be it. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, thank you very much. That's been, I've getting that question a lot, like in regards to um, what that looks like. And so I, I realize I need to be clear what that, what, mm -hmm. what, what's happening in our relationship is. Yeah. Got yeah, it. We Got it. So before we wrap up, we have some rapid and random questions. So R and R for you. you. <laughs> um, all right. First question. What is the first thing you do in the morning? I listen to, um, I drink water because the amount of tasting I have to do regularly. I try to drink a gallon of water a day, so I'll chug like 32 ounces first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I listen to VPR um, like on my Bluetooth thing, and I'll turn on MSNBC like with subtitles, and I'll start getting ready, like slowly getting ready. Yeah. Got it. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. What's the last? What I do in the morning. First thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the last TV show you watched? Um, uh, Chef's Table on Netflix. Oh. Uh, it is really said the desserts and like that. I mean, I I seek my inspiration from other people, either fermenting, may not look exactly like me, or cooks and chefs, and I just in a, in a, in a recenters me and reminds me. You know, when you hear those stories and their journeys and past and how they're continuing inspired and we're all conspired by each other. Um, I watched all five episodes, been watched it actually two nights ago, and I'm now regenerated again. Mm. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. What's your go-to meal after a long day of farming? Uh, tacos. I think I'm from California, and it's easy <laughs> to make. Tacos are delicious. Yeah, I just, like, I have, I, like, I just, whatever I have, like, it either be raw vegetables that I've got from my CSA, or there's potatoes, or there's meat. It's the easiest thing I can make in 20, like, less than 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I feel, like, I'm satiated, so that's basically, like, and sometimes I don't want to, I don't want to do anything, but just, yeah. the last thing I want to do is cook. Yes. And so it's the easiest thing. And does it have to be a specific kind of taco? Is it fish, shrimp, chicken, beef? It's never like in my, like, what's ever inside my refrigerator or freezer. Okay. But I would thaw it out. Like, I'm not, I don't have time to be thawing anything out. So if I had any meat, like leftover meat, mm -hmm. always, like, put it up and put it inside there, too. And so I always make veggie tacos, not because that's what I necessarily am craving, but mm -hmm. that's, I'll just make four of those. Got <laughs> yeah. Got it. Do you have a wine pet peeve? And that can be in the vineyard, in the tasting room, in a restaurant, dinner party. Anywhere. I think the only time I get, and it's never at the fault <clears throat> who's doing it. It's um, and this happens in bars too when someone thinks they're hooking you up, but they're actually so like in wine when they pour like eight ounces in an eight ounce glass, like it's to the rim. Oh. Uh, and you pour like too much, and you and it's usually someone who doesn't have any service industry in the that wine world and so it's usually at restaurants and I and I can't get mad because it's not their fault and then like I can't be I shouldn't be so bougie to get annoyed <laughs> right just, but it does like it does irk me but then I check myself and then I get over it and drink it yeah. <laughs> right like that's you, a good question Sarita for you too if you, you oof. um when you go to dinner parties and people just do the most, they do like too much, too much. You go and they're having, I, I, people get excited about wine and I don't want to be that one to say don't do these things, but they've got too much going on. They've got wine glasses, they've got charms on them, there's stickers all around her, there's a marker, there's just, just, just too much. Just give me a, a, a naked glass. That's, that's all. That's it. That's it. So that, that has become one of my pet peeves. People are just so passionate about wine. They just want to get involved and they have all these fucking accessories and everything. It's just, <laughs> it's just too much. Yeah. Sometimes it's I get too much. much. Like you can write your name on it with these pens yeah. and I have some charms yeah. and a label to stick on the side. Look at these fun little things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm simple. I don't like dirty glasses. Yeah. That's and, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and, and I mean by dirty, I'm not saying like, oh, you like completely bogus, you didn't even try. But like if yeah. it's spotted or street, yeah. no, I like my glasses completely like shining, like rainbows in them, light hits them, and it is, com yeah, mm -hmm. I, I like mine like oh, super yeah. pristine. Especially if I'm in a tasting room. If you hand me this streaky, water spotted glass. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I question your whole establishment. What, what are you doing? Because it's easy to get a clean glass. <laughs> oh, my so, gosh. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, sorry. Brief sidebar. Okay. All right, carry no, on. No, no, no. Chris, okay. back to you. It's your show. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, after a really good day of winemaking, you come home to unwind. What song are you playing and what are you sipping? Song will change. I could give you a range of like what I'll be listening to. Mm -hmm. Range from Al Green because it makes me think of like my grandma and being back home and my family. And then it could go from there to Vince Staples' latest album to Kendrick Lamar and Tupac. Also, Kendrick Lamar just won a Pulitzer, uh, Pulitzer Prize today. Yes. But, yeah, we but, saw what? Yeah. Play. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I from that to that. And it just depends on if I'm like pumped up, like from having a good day in the cellar or in the vineyard, or if I just want to chill. If I'm cooking, it'll be like more on the all green end or need a bigger end. Like, cause it reminds me, like, like I said, of being at home, like back home. And then if I'm like, like really vibing out, it'll go from like Ben Stables to Kendrick to Tupac. Got it. Which, yeah. Yeah. Which I named one of my wines after a Tupac song, so I'm very, 
Yeah. All eyes on really? me. Is that uh, what it's called? I wore well. I, I remember I did wear a Tupac shirt, I and mean, he's flipping everyone off. Which, and then I, but I did against all odds, which is a song on Machiavelli. Mm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then and another next winter, so I'll do another song. Um, so I have a whole half sleeve of uh, Tupac's uh, "An Ode to His Poem, The Rose Grew from Concrete," and so P- Tupac has a lot of influence in my art expression. Nice. Expression, nice. yeah. And what would you be sipping? Uh, right now, because I, I want to, I, I, all my wines, basically I'm creating a, my version of a sparkling house. So 95% of my wines will be sparkling, are sparkling wines. Yes. Um, that I will not be sparkling as if I feel after, especially the champagne method, uh, I feel that it's better fit as a still wine. Um, I will listen to the wine. So I just draw a lot of, I try to drink as many um, sparkling wines as possible in regards to inspiration. And right now my favorite is a Colfondo Prosecco um, from um, producer Canizago in Italy. And that's my go-to. And I have uh, a wine bar that I could have, uh, sorry, wine shop that I have readily access to. So I try to stock up in that at least weekly. And it's simple, clean. The acidity is beautiful. Um, the price point is below twenty dollars, and it's a perfect wine. And it's an ode to tradition too. Nice, so. very nice. So our last question is: Tell us about one of your favorite bars in Vermont. Um, I would say Daedalus, um, for proximity, and also for it's a wine bar and shop, um, and also you know um, that. Jason and Scott have been so supportive of me, my journey since I've been since the moment I landed in Vermont. Um, and he, his staff members come out um, when I was working for, well, I was assistant winemaker, a lot of Regista, they would come out and harvest and print with us. And now that I have, that I'm managing this vineyard out here and I have my own label, um, I receive numerous requests, people asking they could come out and help me. Like, I'm like, are you mm-hmm. fucking kidding me? You're, you want, like, you're asking me? Like, of course you could come help me. And so <laughs> I have, and I go there and it's like my version of cheers and they mm-hmm. take care of me in every way possible. Um, not just, you know, that I go in there and, you know, they hook me up with food and wine, which they do, but it's about how they treat me as a figure in this community that they want to support and see succeed. Uh, so I have much less for them because they give me a lot of love. And say the name again. Daedalus. Daedalus. Yeah. Daedalus. When you come out here and visit, we'll take you there. I'll take uh, you there. Of course. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> Summer's in Vermont. Uh, All right. Uh, well, awesome. it'll probably be more fall for me, but you know, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. It's the worst time of the year, and that's like you should come during fall, honestly. Okay. Or yes. next, or anytime after. May is a good time, but June, July, August, September, even until October, that block is it's gorgeous out here. Okay. Yeah. About when are you doing harvest? Because then that probably wouldn't be a good time for you. No, it's probably, yeah. Uh, it would be, um, well, I'm always, I'm harvesting apples too, but mm. the great, the most time, like, because I have my tasting room and winery is an hour away from the, the vineyard. So, yeah, anyone coming out here and harvest would not be a good idea. But I would say after October 15th is the best time to come. Okay. Or before, okay. yeah, anytime before July. Anytime before I go to Texas, uh, which I leave there, head out there around mid-July, and anytime after October 15th. Okay. Now, you're harvesting apples. Do you allow people to pick them, like how some people have, like, farms and things where people can come in and, you know, they have a couple days where people can come and pick apples and have those for their yeah. lives and home? Uh, well, well, there's one I do wild foraging, so, like, I'm literally getting apples from off the street, and so those are my <laughs> apples, and I can't, I can't, like, those are, I'm, you know, me and whoever's coming with me are, like, shaking the trees, and there's a tarp Okay. Over. Uh, the, but I also been lucky enough, like I said, to have access to over 150 trees from that the lawyer, uh, guy. Um, and he is pretty, I mean, I'm sure if anyone, if I wanted to bring anyone out to help Blake forge for themselves, he wouldn't mind that I, okay. yeah, I couldn't bring a whole village with me, but right. if it's, you know, but anyone want to come out, uh, I brought out a couple people out there to help me this last year. Anyone want to take any lungs on their own? Um, and my, you know, only thing I'm trying to do is like for him, give it to me is like, of course, acknowledging his orchard on the label, 
Um, so I had nothing to do with that. And I feel like anyone who's buying fruit from, for example, growers should be honoring those, honoring mm -hmm. those people too. Um, the farmers are, have worked their ass off uh, to grow fruit. And then in, in wild forage, even if there's an orchard that's already been created, you should honor the people who have maintained that land. And, um, and so that's my way of doing that too. Mm. Okay. Well, any more thank you questions? for answering our yeah, questions. Sure. Right. I don't have any more like yeah. serious questions, but just do you have any final thoughts, anything that you want to leave us with, any nuggets of wisdom <laughs> or why knowledge or a fun fact about an apple? <laughs> um, I just think that you guys should keep on doing what you guys are doing. This has been the most relaxed. I've been like I've been interviewed quite a bit the last two months and this is honestly the, the one I felt least nervous about. And it's also refreshing to sit across and be interviewed people who look like me too. And collectively we can keep on spreading, you know, I give access to people that look like us and know like this, the wine world is not that intimidating, but they need to see people like us too and know that it's mm -hmm. a safe space. So you guys are helping make and create a safe space for people like, if I, like, I would have known this existed I wish this existed 10 years ago or five years ago before I started my journey. But the fact that it's happening right now, you're really going to create more Kristas, hopefully. Yeah. So thank that's you. That's, I want to end with that. Thank you guys for having this. No, thank you for being on the thank show. We are you. honored to have you here. Right. Oh, we awesome. don't exist if we don't have you and people yeah. that are out there killing it in um, the wine industry for us to talk to. So mm -hmm. we definitely want to highlight that. So yeah, and of Thank course you. we have to drink your wine. So I mean, I will. Yeah, yeah I, <laughs> I will send you. No, I'm basically this whole vintage. Um, I'm signing, like I said, I'm signing my distribution deal. But this vintage, I want to be able to give access, give wine bottles to wines. I mean, bottle, <laughs> Bottles of my wines to people who have been supporting me, this, especially this last uh, this last year. And mm -hmm. I've allocated a portion of that just to give thank you to people because a lot of people have not been able to taste my wines, you know, outside of Brumaire. And even then, that was an insanely generous crowd of people who showed up their support. So uh, the public may not have full access to it soon, but I want to give love and thanks to the people who have given me support for me able to continue to do this, you know, do a full vintage next year. So you definitely, I'll definitely be sending you guys some bottles of my wine. That sounds amazing. Can't wait. <laughs> Can't wait. Before we go, tell everybody where they can find you. Uh, I am on Instagram at Krista K. Scruggs. That's K-R-I-S-T-A-S-C-R-U-G-G-S. Um, and or zoffawines.com and then from there you can read all the articles the people who have tasted my wine so far and all the press has been going around and but I think Instagram is the best too I'm pretty active on there in regards to being transparent about my journey and my day-to-day -day life in the farm and in the cellar so I think Instagram is the best way to, to have access to me and anyone can ask me questions all the time. I'm not the best. I'm not easily responsive. I'm not, not quickly responsive, but I do reply eventually. <laughs> Mostly because I'm in the vineyard. <laughs> <laughs> well, Krista, thank you so much for joining us. You have a good night. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers. Hi, guys. That wraps up the show. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes. Like us on SoundCloud. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Send us any questions or concerns at squirrelsweet.com. Any ideas? Let us know. Cheers.